Good morning. We want to welcome everyone here this morning, and it's glad to see everybody out on this somewhat rainy day. Um, the scriptures this morning is welcome. <laughs> John fourteen twenty seven. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. So it's nice to know that God will give us peace if we come to him with our troubles. So let's stand and sing, It Is Well With My Soul. Verses 1, 2, and 4.
With our Heavenly Father, we thank the Lord that you're here to be with us, to keep us in your care, and to give us the gift of salvation and the love you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you will be with these people that I have mentioned. I pray that you be with Gordon, and, and I pray that you be with Walter and Jared and Marion. Please be with them and the things that they're having to deal with at this time. And be with their families and help them through it. And I pray to the Lord that you'll continue to be with all of us here. And, and we thank you for what you have done for us and for keeping us in your care. And I pray, Lord, to be with those that need you in, in things that we do not know. And I pray, Lord, and thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. And now we're going to have the choir sing today. <laughs> we're kind of small, but we're mighty.
appeared like the backup guy. So rather than rig up all these gadgets on me, I'll use this here. The community thought this morning, uh, I just want to mention to the fact that I've been watching a TV program uh, called, uh, it's on Friday night, called Genesis. Any of you see that? Any of you see that? It's on Friday, Friday night, it's called Genesis. And I've only seen parts of, I just come by it by accident. This thing ringing on me? Uh, I've only seen parts of it, uh, of the show, a couple of times. The program seems to be uh, privately sponsored because they're asking for donations, but it deals with the disproving of uh, evolution and scientific belief of Earth's creation. I like to see that kind of thing and watch that just to see what others got to say about it. But the program seems to hold true the creation of Earth, uh, creation of man, and the heavens, according to the book of Genesis. For Someone not to believe that God exists and all creation was was uh, made by him, I, I can't understand anybody that would believe that. Because I reread the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 and 1. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 31 says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And I believe in those verses. I trust in those verses. Some facts about earth now. These are not facts that I can verify. Uh, it's what other people have written, and some of it comes from that program. And there's a whole list of reasons why he, he uh, is disproving evolution. But uh, some things about Earth. This is our, our growth. The globe weight has been estimated at 6 trillion tons. I'd take a while to figure that out, wouldn't I? I got no idea what a trillion is. And when you have six trillion, must be an awful lot that anybody wants to start counting. We'll see you in a couple of years and see if you get to the end of it. Then, another theory is the fact that the Earth is uh, precisely tilted at 23 degrees. And if there was any more or less than that 23 degrees, uh, we become a big pool of water, uh, to say the least. Then other things that they've said here about it. So the Earth revolves at the rate of a little better than 1,000 miles per hour, or 25,000 miles per day, or 9 million miles per year, yet none of us tumble off out into space. Every square yard of the sun is estimated to be constantly emitting 130,000 horsepower of light and heat every square yard. It's said that if you hold a dime, and I have a dime here somewhere, so are you young people know what a dime is? Do you? Well, in my day, in Vernon's day, in Vernon's savings day, <laughs> that dime used to buy me two ice cream, five cent ice creams, or a, a popsicle or something like that. So that's why I didn't think you guys remember what a dime was. Because it doesn't go very far today. But this, this guy said if you hold the dime up and point it towards the sky and try the block, just look through it and just see what's through it, that behind that dime would be 15 million stars you're not seeing. 15 million. Start to think how big the Earth is. By showing us earth and heavens, Jesus has shown his father's workshop. And he taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, your father can handle anything for you. Do you think today that there's an outside chance that Jesus cares enough about you and I, you and I, to meet our needs? Do you think Jesus cares enough about us? We pray. And sometimes our prayers are awkward. I remember a number of uh, us as we started to pray in public and some of the congregational meetings today uh, that we have that people used, used to get up and just pray through the congregation. But people are learning to pray and at first it seemed awkward. 
You know, effort seems to be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, prayers make a difference. Creation helps to prove the existence of God. Jesus confirmed his care for us by giving of his life. What more do we need? What more do we need? As we gather around this table this morning, I'd ask you to give thanks for the cup and the loaf as we will I hold the cup on the last end and take it together. Dearly Father, as we gather around this table this morning, we give you thanks for the many things that you have created. But the thing we give the most thanks for is the gift of your Son that you sent to earth to be here with us, to die on the cross for us, for our sins. As we come here this morning, we ask you to bless this loaf and bless this cup, which is the symbol of that body and blood that you shed for us. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen. One thing that you should take comfort in, Sonny, is when you come off the bench, the most popular guy on the team is the backup. Uh, and you should take comfort in that. It's true. <laughs> the backup guy is the most popular. <laughs> most popular guy on the team is the backup, right? It's true. It's the starters that get criticized. Hmm. It's always that way. Uh, <clears throat> the ladies retreat. Man, I've heard some awesome stuff from the ladies retreat. I, I think we ought to just give God some glory. <laughs> one of the things that, from the things that Christy was telling me about, one of the things that I took away from it was just that uh, it is true. I've said it so many times, and I'll continue to say it over and over and over again. This is a powerful church. There is power in this church. There's power in you, not because of who you are, not because of what this church is, but because of who Jesus is. And, and we are his church. That means we are a church with power. And the truth is, and we see this over and over and over again in Scripture, and I think maybe even for the first time, some of our ladies experienced this this last weekend. When, when God's people gather to do God's stuff God's way, God's power is revealed in that. That's just a fact. It's a scriptural fact. When God's people show up to do God's stuff God's way, God's power is revealed. When I humble myself and I reveal how powerful God is and how less I am, make more out of God, make less out of me, any time that I, I do that, I reveal the power of God. When I share how God is working in my life and what he's giving to me, when I make it about God, God's power is revealed in that. Every time we gather as a church... We can experience the power of God today if we decrease and allow God to increase. And I believe that that's what the ladies experienced this last weekend. And, and I think that's fantastic. And I, I, I hope and I want to encourage you more and more. And I want to thank the ladies for being an example in that. I want to thank you for being an example in that. Uh, I'm very proud of you in that. My grandma's favorite song was, I Got a Mansion. The song that we sang, the, the choir sang this morning. When I was a kid, we had these uh, weekly family, or not weekly, monthly family sing-alongs. Uh, my grandma really enjoyed getting the family together, and we'd, we'd sing in her living room. Of course, I grew up in a family that believed that if you worship with an instrument, you were going to hell. So <laughs> it was just it was just voices. Um, but. Uh, but her favorite song was Mansions Over the Hilltop, so we would sing that all the time. And I remember one time, I was just a little kid, and I remember one time saying, and this was years and years ago too, by the way, so I was, and I just remember one time we sang that song, and I said, Grandma, I, I don't like that song. <laughs> she was like, what? I was like, yeah, I don't like that song. I don't want a harp. I want an Atari. <laughs> and my grandma said, well, you're going to get what Jesus gives you. <laughs> and that kind of leads me into what we're talking about this morning. You're going to get what Jesus gives you. The thing is, Jesus gives us some pretty awesome stuff. It's been a difficult week uh, for us. 
Some people have it rougher than we do. Some people have it a lot rougher than we do. Right now, in a jail cell in Sudan, a woman was condemned to death because she's a Christian. She's got an 18-month-old daughter. And as soon as her daughter is old enough, around two years old or so, the judge sentenced her to die simply because she believes she's a Christian. Have you seen that in the news? It's in the news. There are people who have it a lot rougher than I do. And so I, I keep that perspective always and pray for people all over the world whose lives are in much more chaos and have much more problems and issues than what I do. Some of you sitting in this auditorium this morning have trouble. You have problems too. You have things that stress you out, things that you worry about. And this has just been a week like that for me and, and for Christy. As Jared's kind of, his blood counts are shot, and so every little thing hurts. For the first time since we've started, even going back into 2012, he's had to be on morphine because he's in that much pain. And it's, it's really tough as a parent to see your child in that much pain. So it, it's been tough. And I read this on Monday from Jesus. John 14 says this. I'm leaving you with a gift. You're going to get what Jesus gives you. I'm going to leave you with a gift, Jesus says. Peace of mind. I'm going to leave you a gift. I'm reading this on Monday. Peace of mind. The peace I give, Jesus continues, is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And I just got to tell you, on Monday, reading that, it rocked my world. It rocked my world. Earlier in the week, before Jesus had said, said this in, in his life, what was taking place in his life at this time, earlier in that week, he was welcomed into the city of Jerusalem by a mob, and they were they were uh, strung out along the main street of Jerusalem, and they were yelling, and they were demonstrating for Jesus. Thousands thronged around him. They were crushing his disciples, trying to get as close as they could, get a close view of this one that they were calling the Messiah that was going to restore Jerusalem and the Temple Mount back to Jewish control. He was going to kick the Romans out of Judea. And so they were singing and praising for this new political leader that was going to save them and bring them, uh, redeem them from Caesar. That was a few, a few days ago. Tonight, Jesus is sitting in a room. He's celebrating the, the Jewish ceremony of Passover. For the first time, he shared around the table, just like we did this morning, a time of communion in which he said, every time you do this, remember me. The week had been chaotic. Jesus had raised a dead guy from the grave. The next day on their way to Jerusalem, they were mobbed by this throng that we've already talked about. Jesus tells his disciples he's going to die soon, and they're worried and anxious about what that means and what that's about, and that's rocking in their brain and in their mind. Every morning, Jesus had been teaching in the temple, and then one day he just went crazy town and started knocking over tables and beating people with a whip, and that was chaotic and I'm sure it stressed his followers out, his disciples. I can't imagine Peter, James, and John having a week like this, seeing Lazarus raised from the dead, walking through a thronging, loving mass of people, praising their, their, uh, their friend, getting kicked out of the temple for, you know, destroying tables and stuff. Listening to their best friend talk about how he's going to die soon. Can, can you imagine this? This is the week they've had. Have you ever had a week like that? I have never had a week like that. 
But I've had <coughs> some tough times. I know what it means to be troubled. Make no mistake about it. Around that table in the upper room, the nerves of those men, including Jesus himself, were frayed. They were tired. They were exhausted. They were troubled. Maybe even angry. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever heard bad news? Have you ever been troubled? So I can relate to these guys in that way. Can you? I know what it's like to be exhausted. Mentally and emotionally trying to juggle my feelings and my emotions, managing life and at the same time grieving beyond my ability to cope. You ever felt that way? You ever been there? And so when I listen to these Jesus, uh, these words, I'm, I'm comforted. Jesus spoke these words for a reason. He was breathing life into my heart and my mind. And he was breathing life into the troubled hearts and minds of his followers that night. So here's what Jesus said to his drained disciples. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. So here's the thing. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says that Jesus is the author of my faith. He designed it. He made it. He created it. He's the author of it. So he's the one that's arranged this relationship that I have with God. It's not because of who I am. It's not because of what I do. It's because Jesus made the arrangement possible for me to be with God. He is the author of that. So trust is a genuine effort on my part. It's not just lip service. It's not just showing up once a week and sitting in a pew. It is trust, genuine trust, a belief system and a lifestyle that willingly agrees to live within the context of what God wants from my life in this arrangement. That is trust. I trust that this arrangement that God has made for me is the best thing for me. The way that he wants me to conduct my life, the way that he wants me to live, my attitude, the way he wants me to experience my relationships, my marriage, my job, everything in my life is lived out under the authority of Jesus Christ. Everything. Not just a part of my life, but every single part of my life. That is trust. It's giving my life every part of my life to the authority of Jesus. And that's my choice. That's my choice to do that. And when I do, when I make that choice, and I gotta tell you, sometimes it's a daily thing. I have to remind myself to make this choice to trust God. I have to remind myself to live in under this arrangement to live my life the way God wants me to live it. Peace of mind is the result that I receive from God when I trust Him. Peace of mind is the result I receive from God when I trust Him. It's powerful. It's powerful. Moms are, moms are fickle. They change really fast. The same mom that loved Jesus and was shouting songs of praise to him has now turned against him. Jesus isn't acting the way they wanted him to act. He's not doing the things that they think a political leader who's going to kick Caesar's, uh, Caesar out of Judea is acting. 
And so Jesus knows that when he's arrested and he's taken before Pilate, the mob's going to turn against him because they don't want to follow anyone that gets arrested by the enemy. That kind of defeats the purpose of the Messiah. It's not what they're expecting. So they believe Jesus to be a fraud. On that day, they're going to be disappointed. They're going to be disenfranchised. They're going to be discouraged and angry that Jesus let them down. And they're going to let him know it. They'll shout again, but instead of praises, they'll be asking for his execution. And Jesus knows all this. And then what he says next continues to rock my world because now Jesus says this, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus said that, knowing what was going to happen. So I want to just talk for a moment about what this peace of mind is. I don't know, do you want it? I mean, have you ever really wanted peace of mind? Does that sound like a cool, awesome thing to have? Peace of mind and heart? Here's the thing. Many people say they're believers. And they think that everyone's going to go to heaven. And I know that because that's how they live. They, live, they say they're Christians, but they live the way they want to live. They don't live it for God's glory. They're just doing what they want. And they obviously must think that it doesn't matter. God's going to, something magic's going to happen and they'll be fine. Many people believe that. In the preface of his book, Love Wins, I don't know if you've read this book or not. It's a guy, it's a book by the name of Rob Bell. In his preface, he writes this. And a lot of Christians, a lot of people who profess faith believe this. I've written this book for all those everywhere who, who have heard some version of the Jesus story that caused their pulse to rise, their stomach to churn, and their heart to utter those resolute words, I would never be a part of that. And you are not alone. There are millions of us. I don't recommend the book, but if you read it, there, I put a link in my blog for a response from a respected biblical scholar. But Jesus teaches something that Rob Bell does not acknowledge, and that is that obeying Jesus is the only way to go to heaven. That's what Jesus says over and over and over. He says it again in John 14, the same chapter we're reading. Rob says there's millions of people who struggle with that message. Well, no doubt. It's been like that since Jesus was speaking those words. In John chapter 6, it said a whole boatload of them left him. So unfortunately for Rob, he doesn't have the authority to change the truth. Nobody does. But what Jesus makes clear is that if you want the peace of mind he offers, you've got to obey him first. You've got to obey Jesus. That's what Jesus said. And I know it's, I, I understand the struggle. I got to tell you, I really do because I struggle with, I'm, I'm human. I, there are days I don't want to do what God wants me to do. I'm just being frank with you. You may not want to hear that from your preacher, but it's true. I really struggle with my human nature sometimes. I can be downright selfish. Don't talk to my kids about that. But it's true. I struggle with it. I understand, but if I want the peace of mind that Jesus is offering, if I want this gift that is going to eliminate the troubles of my heart, I'm going to obey him. The questions that you, you need to be asking are, do, do you want to live for him? Do you want to give your life for him? Do you want to give up your selfish nature and live his way? And there are many, 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 many people Maybe even some who are sitting here this morning who have absolutely and defiantly said, no, I do not want to live for Jesus. Give me the heaven stuff. Give me the grace stuff. Give me the mercy stuff. I want that stuff. But letting go of what I want, mm, no, I'm sorry. I don't want to do that. 
I just want to live the way I want to live, and I want God to bless me anyway. And Rob Bell and other people that believe like him would tell you, hey, that's not a problem. That's the kind of God he believes in. And i got to tell you, I want to. I want to believe in a God like that because that would make it a lot easier. I'm going to live the way I want to live, have all the fun I want to have, and then live my life my way, and then expect God's just going to save me. I want that. But it doesn't work that way. Jesus very clearly said, if you want to be my follower, you must first lay down your selfish nature. Mm. That's tough. A lot of people don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. There are days I don't want to do that. I believe the most conflicted and troubled people on earth are those who want this peace of mind that Jesus offers, because that would just be awesome, but they don't want to give their life to Jesus. And you may be one of those people. So here's what I want to make sure you understand this morning. What I need to understand for me, and what I would hope that you would understand this morning as well, I want you to know that according to what Jesus says, you can have the peace of mind he offers. You don't have to live in conflict with him. You don't have to. You can trust him. You can make the choice to do that. You can trust in his promises, but it's a choice that everybody has to make, right? I can't make that choice for my children. They can't make that choice for me. You can trust in his promises. And then Jesus makes this most awesome, fantastic promise. There's more than enough room in my father's home, he says. As he talks to his troubled followers that night. If this were not so, would I have told you? I'm going to prepare a place for you. Heaven's called a lot of things in the Bible. I'm going to ask Nancy to make a way on up here. We're going to close here. Heaven's been called a lot of things. A country, a city, a kingdom. But here, when Jesus wants to comfort his followers who are troubled and, and full of worry and anxiety, and they're exhausted and they're tired. If you've ever felt that way, here's what Jesus says. He, he doesn't call heaven in that moment a country or a city or a kingdom. You know what he calls it in that moment? When you need the most comfort, when you need the most help, you know what Jesus calls heaven? He calls it home. He calls it dad's house. That's heaven. Dad's house. And you're welcome there. You're welcome to his, his dad's house. Home is where you're comfortable. Home is where you belong. Marian Anderson, she was one of the most celebrated singers of the 20th century. She was once asked, what is the most memorable moment of your life? And when she answered, she didn't mention the time that she sang before the President of the United States. That was not the most memorable moment of her life. She didn't mention the time she was invited to sing before the king and queen of England. That was not the most memorable point in her life. She didn't mention the time she sang before almost 80,000 people for an Easter morning service in Washington, D.C. She didn't mention that time either. She said the most memorable moment of my life was... The day that I went home to my mom and told her, Mama, you don't have to do other people's laundry anymore. 
That's the most memorable moment of my life, Marian Anderson said. In essence, this is what Jesus is telling you and me this morning. He's telling us the same thing. They were troubled, those guys. They were worried. I've been there. I am there. They were confused, conflicted, and I've been there too. Maybe even angry. I've been there. And so Jesus tells them, there's a time and a place where and when you won't have to deal with these troubles and these problems anymore. There is a time and a place where you won't have to do your dirty laundry. There is a time and place when that will happen. Every day, Multiple times a day, I need this message from John 14. I need these words of Jesus in my heart and in my mind. I need this peace of mind. I need this gift of the Holy Spirit. I give my life to Jesus. It's my choice because I love him. Because he loves me. And because he loves me, he gives me peace of mind. Peace of mind. It doesn't matter what trouble is bothering me. And I'm going to tell you something. Even if I were sitting in a jail in Sudan awaiting execution, these words would bring power. This is power. Holy Spirit power. Jesus absolutely rocks my world. Let's pray. Jesus, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get what you give. And we couldn't be more grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, there's your words are power. You tell us that. You tell us in the Bible that your word is living and active. It's powerful. It's life. Jesus called it the bread of life. We are so grateful, God, for these words that give us power. It was no accident that Jesus said these specific things on a night where his followers were the most troubled they'd ever been in their life. It was not a coincidence. Jesus intentionally said in that moment trust in God trust in me you said that so that our hearts can be at peace so our minds can be at peace and I'm just so grateful God for those words and for the way that you intentionally speak into our life and through the power of your spirit you bring those words to life in such a way that we overcome we overcome it's joy joy replaces fear hope replaces uh, anxiety love replaces hate and bitterness there's power in the words of Jesus but we we need to give our lives to you. That's a choice that each and every single one of us needs to make. So I pray, God, for all of us this morning. I pray that that's the choice we make. I pray every single one of us would make that choice. If there's anyone that's conflicted here this morning, still struggling with that trust thing, I just pray, God, that they'll just open their hearts and minds to, to know that you mean what you say. You say what you mean. And it's power. Pure, awesome power. And we thank you, God, for that. I just want to continue, God, to say thanks for all of the help and support and gifts that we've received, not only from this church, but from the community and, and from your church worldwide. And we're just grateful, God, for the prayers that go up. 
But not only for, for us, but for, for everyone who struggles. You hear so many prayers all of the time from all over the world. And our prayers go out for, for those who are sitting in jail cells, for those who are being persecuted, for those whose stories right now are a whole lot worse than our own. And we pray for them. And I pray, God, that they're hearing your words and experiencing your power. Just as your followers did who sat around that table that day, most of them, all of them except for one, executed as well for what they believe. But they're in that home. They're in your home. And that's where we want to be. We want to be at home with you. So thank you, God, for making that arrangement possible. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.